You know, if I told you that God sent His own Son to this earth and that He would only live about 33 years and His entire life would be measured by the last three years He was here, what would we think? Well, let's, let's, let's make it a little more personal. Let's say, if God told you, if you knew for a fact the day from the day you were born, you were going to live 33 years. And the last three of those years is what your entire life would be measured by. What would you do with those last three years? What would you do? Well, Jesus did more with those last three years than any person any nation, any leader, any kingdom for that matter, that there's ever been or ever will be. One of the top historians of the 20th century, and of course famous author H.G. Wells, he said, more than 19, and I quote, more than 1900 years later, a historian like myself who doesn't even call himself a Christian finds the picture entering irresistibly around the life and character of this most significant man. The historian's test of an individual's greatness is, what did he leave to grow? Did he start men to thinking along fresh lines with a vigor that persisted after him? By this test, Jesus stands first among all who have ever lived. And someone else said, you can gauge the size of a ship that has passed by by the size of the wake it leaves behind. By any measure, Jesus' life, especially the last three years of His ministry, left the largest wake that's ever been left. So, we focus on what Jesus focused in on. He focused His entire life in those three most significant years, he focused all of that on two things. Finding missing persons and making committed disciples. So if Jesus had the most significant life that it has ever been, and He calls us to Himself, He saves us. It's not for no reason. He wants us to have the most significant life we can have also. So don't you think it makes perfect sense that our focus of our life should be the same thing that Jesus focused His life on? You know that there are a thousand Americans an hour, both children and adults. That's 900,000 a year that are reported missing. You've all heard the Amber Alerts go out for missing persons and and that whole Amber Alert system was brought about from a tragic story of a little girl named Amber in Texas that was abducted. But you've all heard those Amber Alerts go out. And I think about what that actually means. That means somebody is missing. Somebody is not where they're supposed to be and nobody knows where they are. Now the hope is that somebody out there can find that person that's missing. And I look around our sanctuary, now, even when all our church family's here, I, 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 see, I see empty spaces in pews. I see little empty spaces here and there. Even when everybody's here, there's still empty spaces in pews. Now why did God bless us with all these seats? there's nobody out there missing to fill them. You see, Jesus' ministry was about finding missing people. So our ministry as a church should be to also find missing people and make committed disciples. That's the whole purpose of us being here. And I think of all the things, think about it folks, all of the things Jesus could have done with his life. All the things he could have been. The author. He could have written book after book after book. He knew everything. 
Can you imagine Jesus opens a chain of all-you-can-eat buffet restaurants? They don't even have to hire a cook. He gets a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fish and 5,000 people come through the Jesus Golden Corral and they never have to cook anything. they got more left than when they started. Man, think of the profit margin there. Jesus could have went on the, the speaking circuit. He could, have, he could have gotten paid by every university, every, every place of higher learning all over the world. He could have been a celebrity. He could have been famous. He could have done all those things. He could have been anything he wanted to be. But he didn't. He gave his life to those two things. Finding missing people and making committed disciples. Now what do we want to take away from this? The key takeaway from this. When you make the purpose of His life, and that's finding missing persons and making committed disciples, when you make the purpose of His life the purpose of your life, you'll find the real purpose of all life. And that's the key to this whole series. And he summed that whole thing up. It was all summed up in the first command Jesus ever made. You know, you realize the first command that Jesus in his earthly body ever made was follow me. You notice he didn't say, hey, why don't you think about following me? He didn't say, you know what, it'd be a good idea if you'd follow me. He didn't make it a suggestion, folks. It's a command. Jesus commands us. Follow me. And that sums up everything. Because if we follow Jesus, the focus of our life will be the focus that was His life. understand, uh, I've heard it said, you know, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step, and that's true. Today's message in this series is actually the journey begins. And I think of the journey begins, I start thinking of trains and planes and ships and going on vacation and uh, I like going on trips with, with Amy and the kids and uh, you know, if, it's, if it takes five hours to drive from where we start, where we're going, it'll take us ten because you know you got the we got to stop and get a snack at this exit, and then two exits later we got to stop and use the bathroom. You know, nobody else ever experienced that with me. Nobody else ever been on a family trip. You ought to try. You'll stop a lot, but it'll be fun. Not not if you're a pop. It's one way ticket. Huh? No layovers with pop. We're going to see how the journey began for the, 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 the people on this earth that were the closest to Jesus and how He started them on that journey that would change everything in their life. And in fact, everything in the history of the world would be changed by the things Jesus taught them and how it began. We're going to look at the, the journey the disciples went through. Thinking about going on a journey, I heard a I heard a story about a airplane. You know, the longest trip I've ever been on, of course, was on an airplane. And uh, you know, if you've ever been on a plane, you know how you know Michael and Tiffany was. It, it's usually pretty pretty tight quarters on an airplane. You know, there's not a lot of room to move around. You know, so it's kind of stuffy in there. And it, it, once you, the plane looks so big from the outside, but then when you get in there, it, it really feels kind of small, and you're thinking, this this is really just a, a, a little tube of metal that's going to be flying thousands of feet in the air at hundreds of miles an hour, and I'm in here, I'm stuck here. And, and it's kind of an uncomfortable situation, honestly. And... Uh, I heard a story about an uh, airplane flight and the flight had taken off and, and, and they were they gotten up to altitude and there was this little boy and, it, and this little boy was just irritating. He was crying, he wouldn't stay in his seat, he's, he's kicking the seat in front of him and the people in front of him are 
getting irritated. He jumps up, runs up and down the aisle. And he's screaming, he's crying. Nobody can go to sleep. Nobody can read. I mean, he's just he is just ruining the trip for everybody. And 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 suddenly this man from kind of the back part of the plane, he gets up and he he's an Air Force general. And he has on his uniform and he's got all his medals and everything. And he, he gets up and he walks up to the little boy's seat. And he, and, he, and he puts his big hand on that little boy's shoulder and he leans over and he whispers something to him. The little boy sits down in his chair and buckles his seatbelt up and never moves again. The general walks back and he sits down in his seat just as calm as he could be. And the, the man next to him said, Sir, I, I have to ask you, what in the because that 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 little boy's mama had she she whooped him she grabbed I mean just nothing worked he was driving everybody crazy and, and everybody on the plane you can just feel the sense of relief he said I've got to know what did you tell that little boy he said well I, I, I told him that I was an Air Force general and I said do you see these medals and he said yes sir. And I said, do you, do you see these, these ribbons and, and everything on my uniform? And, 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 and this one says that I'm also a, a pilot. And did you know that all these medals give me the authority to throw one passenger off of any flight I want to? And if you don't want to be that person, you'll sit down and be quiet. <laughs> yeah. You know what the cool thing is? This journey we go on with Jesus, He's never throwing us off. If we get off this plane, it's because we chose to. Now turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 5. The book of Luke chapter 5. And again, we're going to look at how Jesus called His first disciples in, in Luke chapter 5. Oh, we're going to go to verses 1 through 11. If you would, when you get to Luke chapter 5, let's, let's stand together. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and, and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word I will let down the net. And when they'd done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed Him. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for this day, for this opportunity to be in Your house. We especially pray for our, our church family that could be with us today, Lord, that You protect them, You watch over them, you bless us with the opportunity to be here with them again Wednesday, Father. But today we're here and we desperately seek a word from You. Father, I pray that You'd give me that word, that You'd give me every word to say and every thought to have. Father, that we would have an experience with You, Lord. And we know that when two or more are gathered in Your name, You're in our midst, Father. We thank You for that. We thank You for being here. We thank You for Your Holy Spirit being here among us today, Lord. I thank You for Your disciples and, and of course, most of all, Your precious Son, Jesus. We can learn so many things from them. I pray that You just teach us, Lord. Lift us up. Mold us and shape us today. 
to be what You'd have us be. And I thank You again for this opportunity, Lord, and for Your holy, precious Word, and most of all, for Your Son, Jesus. It's in His name we pray. Amen. And you can be seated. So we're looking at how Jesus called His first disciples here in chapter 5 of Luke. We're seeing how the first disciples get called. And, and as we're reading about them, we can see the steps they take are the same steps all of us must take. And the first one is to hear the Word of God. The first thing we have to do is hear the Word of God. And I read Luke 5 and 1 again. It says, So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. Now Jesus had been in his earthly ministry here for just a little bit, and he knows he's got three years. Jesus' death and resurrection wasn't a surprise to him. He was God. He knew exactly how long He had. Remember time after time He said, for my time has not yet come? He knew exactly how much time He had. So, knowing that, we want to focus on why He did what He did. And this story begins, this recording begins here with Jesus saying He taught the Word of God. They pressed about Him to hear the Word of God. And how do we know that's what He was doing? Because John 1 and 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, the only Word Jesus could teach was the Word of God because He was God. So everything He said was the Word of God. So we know He's teaching the Word of God because that's all He can speak. He is God. So he's, he's teaching the Word of God. He's preaching the Word of God. He's healing people in His ministry. And we look here. And we ask, what exactly was He teaching the crowd here in Luke chapter 5? All we have to do is look back at Luke 4.43 to find out. It says, But He said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. His first purpose was to teach His Word to people. Was to preach His Word to people. And that's what He was doing. He was teaching them about what it says there in verse 43, the kingdom of God. He taught them that a light had come into the great darkness that the captives were to be set free, that we were to have eternal life. That's what the kingdom of God was all about. But you know, Christians, a lot of times we, we focus on current problems and we focus on the future reality of heaven, but sometimes we get lost in what happens in between. Well, Jesus did. He never got off track. He never got off course. He never was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Amen? And He said, I'm teaching and preaching the kingdom of God. But look at verses 2 and 3 of chapter 5. He stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. Now for people to respond to the Word of God, they have to hear the Word of God. And Jesus knew that better than anybody. So why did he get out in the boat? Did you know that you ever been to the lake and you can hear people way over across the lake talking? You know, it's because sound travels seven times further across water than it does land. Now obviously Jesus knew this because He spoke and all that water and land leapt into existence. Amen? So Jesus knew that. So He says, for this crowd to respond to My Word, I've got to make sure they can hear My Word. 
So he gets out of the boat. Now the whole crowd can hear him. Clearly, decisively. And isn't that the way God speaks to us? You ever been in a church service and you, you're listening to a message or you're, you're hearing a beautiful song and 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 you're like, what, what am I doing here? What, what's God trying to tell me? And then He speaks to you and it's so clear. And it doesn't matter if anybody else around you or anybody else in the sanctuary is getting the same thing you're getting. You know God is speaking to you so clearly, so decisively. And that's what He wanted to do here. He wanted to make sure that the people heard His Word. Because the first thing we have to do to respond to God's Word is we've got to hear God's Word. The first step is to hear the Word of God and the second step is to trust in the Son of God. Look at verse 4. When He had stopped speaking, He said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Alright, we look back and we saw who is Jesus? Jesus is the Son of God. He is speaking the Word of God. He's speaking the Word of God about what? The Kingdom of God. The Kingdom of God to men standing around that were fishermen, to ordinary people, people on this earth. The Kingdom of God is something in the distance. It's something after death that we're going to deal with. And Jesus is talking to them about spiritual things and heavenly things. And that He's speaking and preaching about the Kingdom of God. He's not talking about this life. He's talking about eternal life. And He's talking to them about this and, and, and people are hearing Him. But in order for that hearing to make any difference, they've got to trust in Him. So, this here in verse 4, when Jesus tells Simon, by the way, Simon is Peter. That's Simon Peter. When He tells him, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. That was the last thing Peter wanted to hear. Now think about this. Peter and his friends had been out fishing all night. And they hadn't caught anything. Now if any of you know somebody that really is into fishing, you let them go fishing they don't catch anything, they're going to be ill about it. But what's even worse here is that, that Peter and his friends weren't fishing for fun. They were not trying to catch the biggest fish. They were not trying to catch something to mount on their wall. They're out there trying to make a living and feed their family and now they've spent all night out fishing and had not caught anything. Fishing in this time was back-breaking work. The nets they used could weigh up to a thousand pounds. It took several of them to, to take this net. And what they do is they get, they get in a boat. They get in a boat. Looks something like this. And they get out in this boat and they would take that net and they'd run it out in a circle and then they would pull it in. Backbreaking work that they've done all night and they haven't caught anything. And then Jesus says, Hey guys, let's go fishing. No, oh, they've punched the time clock. Peter and his friends, they're, they're, they're going to stop by McDonald's and get them a, a, a Big Mac meal and go home and get back on the couch and watch the replay of the Alabama game or something. And, 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 and they're washing, they're cleaning their stuff up. They're done for the day. They worked all night. They worked all night for nothing. Now the last thing they wanted to hear Jesus say was, load your stuff back up, get back in the boat, and let's go fishing again. That's the last thing they wanted to hear. So to do it, they heard the Word of God. Now they have to trust in the Son of God. Do you understand that Peter says in verse 5, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at Your Word, I let down the net. And why does Peter protest? We talked about it. He's, he's tired. They've been fishing all night. He says, Master, we've caught nothing. He protests for two reasons. One, it was the wrong time. 
Peter thought it was the wrong time. See, it's morning. Why had Peter been fishing all night? Because in the Sea of Galilee, that's when the fish feed is at night. So that's when they fish primarily at night and very early in the morning because that's when the fish went out into the deep water to feed. Also at night, the fish couldn't see the nets as well. During the day, the light shines. It's not a deep ocean, guys. Nine miles wide, 13 miles long. It's about 120 feet deep at the deepest part. So the fish can see the nets in the day and they avoid them. That's why they didn't get out in that, that scorching sun and break their backs to fish during the day. That's why they fished it down in the first place. So Peter thought this is the wrong time. The second thing Peter thought was it's the wrong place. Jesus told him, go out in the deep and put your nets down. Now what Peter knew, Peter's a professional fisherman. He's looking at Jesus. Jesus was a what? A carpenter. And he's probably thinking, I don't want to offend him because there's something to this guy. There's something about him. I mean, I don't understand, but but, but he's a carpenter. You know, I'm a fisherman. That's what I do for a living. He says, hello, Jesus. <laughs> Look, we fished all night, buddy. We didn't catch anything. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of, I'm good at this. I'm a professional. And, and if I came up here asking you to build a table, you'd probably tell me how to get the wood and what wood to use and you know, all that. And I'd listen to you, but this is about fishing. This is what I do. But Jesus told him to go out into the deep. Now Peter knows it's the wrong time, but he also knows the deep water is the wrong place because the other thing about the fish in the Sea of Galilee is they feed in the deep water at night, but during the daytime, they go to the shallow parts and they hide under the rocks. And they also go to where the little streams and things filtered out and emptied out into the Sea of Galilee. So Peter, a professional fisherman, and his friends, professional fishermen in boats, professional fishing boats, in a community that their whole economy was based on fishing out of that sea, now they're there and there's a multitude. Remember, there's a crowd of people that want to hear Jesus speak. And Jesus is talking to a crowd of people that know all about fishing. And now Jesus tells Peter, get in your boat, go back out in the deep water and put your nets down. And Peter knows that that's the wrong time to fish and that's the wrong place to fish. And he's thinking, I'm going to be so embarrassed. Because all this crowd of people is going to see me out here putting my nets down. They're going to laugh at me. Because they all know better. They know it's the wrong time. They know it's the wrong place. But Jesus asked me to do it. And that's no different than you and me sitting in our pews on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. And Jesus calls you to walk down that aisle. He calls you to make a decision about your life. He calls you to do something with your life. And you're like, I don't want to get up. I'm going to be embarrassed. What's my family going to think? What are my friends at work going to think if I'm some kind of Jesus freak? What are they going to say about me? What are the guys I hang out with, what are they going to think about me? What about my friends? What are they going to say? My family. I mean, going to be embarrassed. But you know good and well when Jesus is calling you. You know good and well when the King of Glory is speaking to you. And in spite of Peter knowing it was the wrong time, it was the wrong place, he went and did it anyway. Let's get real real. Let's get down and get real real. I've been there when I said, Jesus, this isn't the time for me to do this. Jesus, this isn't the right time for me to start this ministry. This isn't the, wrong, this isn't the right time for me to go visit that person or make that phone call. Or I, I, you know I've got this to do and I've got that to do. Lord, you know I'd, I'd have more time if you'd wait till this weekend. Or, or, or. And I've sat in that pew and I said, Jesus, this just isn't the place for me to come down to that altar and make a decision for you. It's in the place. And I've sat there in that altar. And I've sat there in that pew and I've, I've sat there and I just couldn't wait for that church service to be over. Couldn't wait. I couldn't get out the door fast enough. 
And I get outside and I feel so relieved. I got out. I laid down. Because I decided that I knew better than God. And I tell him, Lord, this, this isn't the right time. It's in the right time for me to do this. Lord, this, this is in the right place. And that's what Peter knew about this. He knew this wasn't the right time. And he knew this wasn't the right place. But he'd heard the Word of God. Now he had to make the big decision. Am I going to trust the Son of God? I've heard the Word of God. Now am I going to trust the Son of God? Am I going to trust Him that He's not going to... Make me look like a fool? Am I going to trust Him that He's sending me to the right place at the right time? Am I going to trust Him? And when you decide to trust Him, that walk down that aisle is so much easier. Picking up that phone is so much easier. Answering that call is so much easier. Kneeling down in prayer at home instead of watching TV is so much easier. What I spend my time on during my day, those crucial three years Jesus had, He only had three years, that's not very long. I've already been in ministry over three years. I've already been here three years nearly. So we have to hear the Word of God we have to trust in the Son of God. And this is the great part. This is the good part right here. When we hear the Word of God and we decide to trust in the Son of God, we experience the grace of God. Look at Luke chapter 5 there, verse 6. And it says, And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them and when they came and filled the boat so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, Lord. See, all of Peter's efforts and all of his friends' efforts the night before had gained them nothing. They didn't even have one fish. Professional fishermen fishing together all night didn't have one fish. All of their knowledge and skill and experience and training and know-how had come up short. Let me, say all, let me say this. All of my efforts to make me a better person, and folks, look at every religion out there. Look at every worldview aside from Christianity. And it says, follow these rules in this book and you'll be a better person. Follow these rules in this book, you'll be a better person. You follow what's in this book. He'll make you a better person. That's the difference. All Peter's efforts had come up with nothing. But when he finally said, I've heard the Word of God, and I'm going to trust in the Son of God, now he was going to experience the grace of God. Folks, not one single one of us, no matter how good you are, no matter how much you go to church, no matter how many people you help, no matter how much money you give, no matter any of that, not one of you can get yourself to heaven. Not one person in the history of the whole earth has ever gotten themselves to heaven based on what they could do on their own. of our sin just like Peter and his friends they fell short of what they were trying to do again the little fishing boat I love that picture I love you see the mountains around the Sea of Galilee there and it's, it's not a very big place 
those boats were about seven or eight feet wide, 27 feet long, and, and, and it took a lot of work to fish out of one of these boats. <clears throat> but you know, at this point, they've, they've taken their little boat out in the deep water, and they've caught so many fish. They had to call in reinforcements. They had to call in help. And now they got so many fish in this boat that it's about to sink the boats. Now I can imagine Peter. And the question is what's going through his mind. He's like, I tried fishing all night. We did all the right things at the right time in the right place and came up empty. Now all I did was trust in Jesus and look at what I've got. I bet he couldn't wait to get back to the shore and tell all the fish stories. And for a change, he was going to tell a fishing story that was true. And hey, if you don't believe me, just ask Jesus. <laughs> we got more fish than we know what to do with it. And if we'll just trust in the Son of God, He'll give us His grace and it'll be more than you ever dreamed of. He says He wants to give us life and give it more abundantly. Now I can imagine Peter's, I can't wait to get back to the shore and show everybody. They're not going to believe this in the, in the daytime. In the wrong place. Look at all the fish I caught. I'm such a good fisherman, I can catch fish anywhere, anytime. I catch fish out of my bathtub. That's probably what Peter was thinking, man. I can catch them anywhere, boy. And then I bet he started wondering like, I, I wonder why. Yeah. Then it clicks. Hey, <laughs> you know, I'm just a fisherman, but look here. Me and Jesus need to get to be partners. We need to go into the fishing business because I know how to do it. I know how to fish and he obviously knows where to fish. So me and, yeah, me and Jesus, we'll be partners. We'll go in this together. And then I'll do my own thing and Jesus will just bless it. Woo! What a team we're going to be. I tried that for about 20 years, y'all. It don't work. It ain't going to work. It wouldn't have worked for Peter. It didn't work for Tim. And it won't work for you. I tried Jesus. I'm gonna, look, we're going to be partners in this. I'm going to kind of do my own thing here. I'm going, <clears throat> you just kind of guide me along here and there. You tell me where to drop my net down and we'll be good. But this completely trusting you business, not right now. i got too many things going on. Not, not right here. This is, this is where I'm going to be. I'm, I'm finally where I'm going to be. But I, then I can imagine old Peter going, I wonder why Jesus that could, that's a carpenter and could tell me right where to catch more fish than anybody's ever caught out of the sea. wonder why he's just going around wearing ragged clothes, nowhere to leave and lay his head. He's going around preaching and teaching and healing people. In fact, I wonder why with all the other boats here, I wonder why he even got into my boat. And with all these, obviously these powers that Jesus has and, you know, why is he even concerned about my boat or why did he even show me where to catch these fish or why did he even get my boat to start with? I can see the light bulb going off in Peter's head. I can almost see it. I can almost see it. The light bulb goes off there. Look at verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Mm. And it clicked with Peter right there. Jesus isn't worried about the fame. He's not worried about the fortune. He's not worried about the business opportunities. He's not even worried about the crowd. He's worried about me. Jesus got in my boat because He loves me. 
Jesus got in my boat because He cares about me. He don't care about all the fame and fortune and money He can make. He doesn't care about any of that. He doesn't even care about being popular, but He cares about me. Wow. And then Peter's reaction is the same thing that our reaction should be when you're sitting in that pew and you realize that, that Jesus cares about me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. That's so simple. Jesus loves me. Jesus could have been the most famous author ever. He could have been the most. He could have been the richest man in, in history. He knew exactly which stocks to buy. He knew right where to put the net down. But he wasn't concerned about that. He was concerned about finding missing people and making committed disciples. And that's what he's concerned with here today. When Peter realized that, you know, by the way, they still got two boatloads of fish and the word about the, the boat sinking. None of that mattered to Peter either. And he falls down at Jesus' feet. He falls down at Jesus' feet. And when we realize that the King of glory, the God that created all things, the God that created life from dust of the earth cares about me. Don't it make you want to ask why? Why? Look at verse 10. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, look at this, do not be afraid from now on you will catch men. Just like with Peter, y'all. When we realize we hear the Word of God, we respond to that Word, we trust in the Son of God, when we experience the grace of God, when we fall down at His feet, and I remember sitting in that altar thinking, God is so displeased with me because of how I've led my life. God is so mad at me because of all my sinfulness. God, I can't even bear to think of going to that altar and talking to you. I can't even... I, I don't even know if I could fall at your feet. I think I just have to grovel right up to you. And look at what Jesus does. He says, don't be afraid. Because when we go to Jesus, we get His grace. Jesus didn't come at me with an iron fist. He came at me with open arms. And that's who He is. That's what He is. With open arms. Once we hear the Word of God, we trust in the Son of God, we experience the grace of God, that will always lead us to the fourth step. We follow the will of God. Now look again at that second part of verse 10. He's talking about John, the sons of James and John. It says, Who were partners with Simon? And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. He's essentially saying, what you're doing for a living is not going to be what you're going to do with your life. Many of us have to do things for a living. That's not the focus of your life. That's not what your life is. Your job is not your life. Your way to make a living is a way to feed your family. It's a way to keep the lights on. It's a way to get where you need to get. But the, the point of your life is what God's called you to do with your life. That's when we follow the will of God. Look at verse 11. So when they brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed Him. Now this man's a professional fisherman and in all his years of fishing, he's never caught this many fish at one time. He's just, he's just hit the Grand Slam home run in the seventh game of the World Series. 
He, he he's just scored the winning touchdown in the Super Bowl. He's just got to the zenith of what is his profession. He's in the zone. And he forsook all and followed Jesus. Does that mean that Peter was never supposed to fish again? Well, actually for Peter, yes. That's what it meant. Is that what it means for you? I don't know. But I know this. We trust in the Son of God and He shows us His grace. You can't be there at Jesus' feet and experience His grace and not want to do His will. You can't do it. And if we get to the point in our lives where we're not concerned with the will of God for our life, we've got to get back to that place where we're at His knees again and experiencing His grace again. We've got to be at His feet. Would you get that? It's probably Charles Stanley. Another sermon. That joker won't leave me alone. You realize that Jesus didn't show Peter grace for no reason. Jesus didn't save you for no reason. Jesus didn't give you this day and this opportunity for no reason. Jesus didn't help us to build this church here for no reason. He's got a purpose and He's got a will for it. He wants to make our life count. He wanted to make Peter's life count. Can you imagine this man, Simon Peter, that lived over 2,000 years ago and was a fisherman? If it hadn't been for this time where he heard the Word of God, trusted the Son of God, experienced the grace of God, and followed the will of God, nobody in this room would have ever heard about Simon Peter, the fisherman. It wasn't what Peter did with for his living that was important. It's what Peter did with his life that mattered. That's the same thing for us. And I just so love verse 11. So when they brought their boats to land, they forsook all. Just followed Him.